COVID, the front row remains empty. I'm not exactly sure how that math works, but that is Baptist math. I understand that much. Well, I'm Pastor Chris. Welcome to Glory Baptist Church. So glad that you have joined us this morning, whether you join us online or you join us in person. We are glad to have you worshiping with us today. I'm going to go through a couple of quick items, and then we will jump on into the sermon. Each week, we, we have a grouping of different songs and music. We play them in the sanctuary here. You just heard the last one was Be Thou My Vision, which is a, a traditional hymn, uh, one of my favorite hymns. I don't know. I don't know if you're like me, but occasionally something kind of catches in your mind and things remind you of things. And that song, Be Thou My Vision, while an old song, was a very new song to me. I didn't grow up in a tradition that apparently sang Be Thou My Vision. Or if it did, I don't remember ever hearing that song particularly. And it wasn't until, um, I want to say I was in college that I, I recall ever encountering that song, not knowing at the time, you know, it's kind of funny, you hear this hymn that may be hundreds of years old, but at the moment, it was brand new to me, and I was like, wow, that's a really good song, right? Uh, you know, was, who, who does this? It, it happened to be Rebecca St. James, maybe, it was a Christian singer who, who, who did it, and I, I saw her sing it in a concert, and, and I was just like, wow, she wrote an awesome song, and so I went home and looked it up, much to my surprise. She didn't write the song, of course, but but was was a beautiful song. And so uh, we, we put those songs together and we play them before worship. Uh, we'll be posting them on like Facebook and places like that that you can watch and view and, and look at those and, and worship through those. Uh, our church council is going to be meeting, I guess, a little over a week from now. And I'm sure one of our points of discussion is going to be uh, if, when, where, how, why, as we work our way back towards some semblance of normalcy, singing, and all those kinds of things. And so um, I'm looking forward to the day where we get to sing, where we don't all have to wear masks, although obviously I'm not wearing a mask. And if you read the laws, uh, this is a, a permitted reason for not wearing a mask. And if you read the laws, there's lots of reasons for that. But anyhow, no, the point is that I, I look forward to getting back to a place where we don't have to worry so much about things. I have no idea, and I can't predict the future, how long down the road that'll be, but I look forward to it, and I know many of you do as well. And so we just thank you for being gracious with us uh, because, hey, I'm excited just to have you here. And it's kind of interesting each week, some, some, some people each week come and go and come and go, and uh, who is here and who is not, and, and how that works out. Uh, my wife and son have been gone the last couple of weekends and they wanted to come today. Both of them have a cold. And, and my wife sounds like a, a chain smoker at the moment with a hack. They don't have COVID. It's just the general garden variety cold. But in these times, nobody wants to be sitting in a room with somebody coughing. So my wife's like, I'm going to stay home from church today. All right. <laughs> I understand. And if that's the case for you, if you're not feeling perfectly well and you don't want to join us on a Sunday, we're not going to judge you over that. That's fine. Um, that's the way the world is at the moment. And, and again, um, lots, lots there for discussion somewhere else, not here. But uh, we are glad to have you here for worship today. There were bulletins and informational items on the table on your way in. There are boxes for your offering as you come and go if you would like to give by check or cash. You can do that. We, of course, have online giving, and, and many of you have joined us in that, and we are thankful and appreciative for your support. Uh, that continues to allow us to do the, the ministries that we are doing. Um, a reminder on Wednesday evenings, Roy and Ruth um, continue to produce wonderful meals, and if you didn't get the meal this past week, you missed out. And I'm not exaggerating. It was fabulous. Roy made a lemon chicken that was incredible. I was blown away because, you know, here, you know, food is good when it's fresh, right? I got my food and I let it sit in the box for the better part of an hour and a half before I ate it. And, and you know what kind of leaving food sit there for a while does to it. It gets kind of rubbery and chewy and tough and, and loses some flavor or whatever. Not this stuff. It was amazing, even later on. It was so good. So if you're not joining us on Wednesday evening for dinner, Roy is willing to cook for you. All you got to do is come on by and pick it up. And if uh, you know somebody who might be blessed by that, give them a call and say, hey, 
could I, could I bring you a meal from Glory Baptist Church? We'd like to be a blessing to you. Just before 10 o'clock on, on Wednesday morning, let us know so we have food count so Roy knows how much to prepare. And that's a great opportunity for us to, to love on our neighbors, to be a blessing to others, and, and for us just to be blessed by Roy's wonderful cooking skills. So join us for that. Uh, inside of your worship list, inside of your kind of the, the modern sense of the bulletin, on the second page you'll find a prayer concern list. And this is not everything. Certainly there are prayer concerns that we get that are private and we can't share those publicly. Some of those types of prayer concerns are prayed for by our prayer team. Uh, we have a prayer team that gathers on Fridays. And, and if you don't know this, they pray for each and every one of you. They pray for me. They pray for the church. They pray for our community. They're praying for our nation's leaders. They're praying for our school teachers and our administrative staff and all kinds of things. And they're, they're continually in prayer. They're, they're some really amazing people of prayer and, and I'm honored to have them on our team and blessed by their prayer life and um, would encourage if you ever need prayer they, they would love to pray for you and if you don't know what to pray for during the week this call to prayer is a great thing to pray through because it's going to give you our family of the week this week it's Ray and Fern Scope they were here last week uh, not last week what week was it two weeks ago two weeks ago um, they were here and uh, pray for them and all, you know, whether it's for GLOW or for our military or for all the other things that are listed, you know, our, our missions partners, Pastor Martin Shikuku and Ann and Elder at Kenya or, or uh, folks we're praying for over in Ukraine and, and, and lots of people who certainly could use our prayer. Keep them in prayer. Um, one prayer request that came in this week, and, and I can't really give out the specifics and details, but there's, there's a family in our community, there's just some strife and conflict over possession of the children between separating parents and, and really uh, a lot of tension in that situation. Just be in prayer over that. Uh, you know, we were requested some prayer very specifically for that. W would encourage you to keep relationships in prayer. The, the, the COVID time has really put a stress on a lot of relationships and created a lot of unnatural environments. And so uh, be in prayer for people's relationships. I, I'm not doing it on a daily basis as I was earlier, but I, I'm doing it fairly regularly still. Uh, I hop on Facebook Live and pray. If you need prayer, join me there. I uh, would love to have you pray with me there. Um, one of the things that I've been praying for continually is the relationships of people. And so I would encourage you to pray with us over those things. I am going to lead us into prayer, and then we're going to hop on into the sermon and uh, continue on from there. And so I would invite you, if you would join me here as we lift our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the chance to be together. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the joy in which we can have even uh, in smaller numbers gathered together, God. It, it is a blessing to be your people. And Lord, we know we're not bound by the confines of the four walls of this building to be the church. We can be the church wherever you have us, wherever you send us, and, and whatever task you put before us, we can be those who bring your love into the world. And so I pray as we go about our week this week, Lord, uh, wherever you would send us, whomever it is you have us serving, that you would let us be a light into their lives. Uh, God, you are truly good and we are thankful. And we lift up to you so many things in our prayers that are, are the, the, the damaged effect of sin on the world, Lord, both directly and indirectly, whether it's um, relationships that are broken or, or bodies that are broken from cancer or, or broken parts from age or all sorts of other things, Lord. There's so much in the world, Lord, that's not the way in which you created it and wanted it to be, but it's as a result of the brokenness of the world, God. And, and God, we lift up to you in prayer those who are suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, God that uh, you might bless them, comfort them, bring your mercy upon them. And, and God, where we might be the hands and feet of Christ, where we might love them and serve them, show us how, Lord, that we might do so. And may we give you all glory, honor, and praise through it. God, as we continue to dig into your word today, just pray that it would implant itself deeply in our hearts, that truly we would be just amazed by your grace once again, that we would be humbled by your love, and that, as you tell us, your, your word would not return void, that it would come into our hearts today, God, and, and would transform us, and that we would see you a little more clearly 
and, and know how to love and serve better because of it. God, continue to strengthen us for that end as we dig into your word. It is in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Well, if you would be so kind, if you want to follow along, turn in your Bibles to Genesis 4. Uh, we're going to be there for the most part. I'm going to quote you some other verses that you can certainly look up as well, but most of our time today will be uh, in the first portion here of Genesis 4. Uh, we continue on through our study in the book of Genesis. We've been here for uh, a few weeks now, and um, we started with God's glorious work of creation back in Genesis 1, right? And we've seen more specifically the, the special relationship that God had between himself and Adam in Genesis 2. And then within that, we saw uh, the stipulations of the covenant of works in Genesis 3, right? And, and then we've seen then that fellowship was disrupted. That's kind of what we looked at last week, right? Where, where, where sin enters in, Adam and Eve uh, realize what they have done, they're ashamed, they, they hide from God, they've broken their covenant relationship with God. And, and, and that's kind of the, the mess that we ended off with last Sunday, with, with the, this misery that Adam and Eve are experiencing, that, 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 that they're feeling that is a consequence directly from their sin. And, and the Bible's clear, particularly in this beginning here in Genesis, and the Bible's clear throughout, that, that, that misery is always connected with sin. I mean, imagine this for a moment, right? Last week we have Adam and Eve living in perfection and everything is great. And, 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 and they go to eat of this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Almost with this idea, almost with this concept that if we eat this fruit, we're going to be like God, right? Yay, we're going to be like God. Um, no, right? We, we, we know the rest of that story, don't we? They're not like God in the sense that they became something greater. In fact, very much the opposite, of course, right? They were not like God. Instead, it was misery, shame. It was conflict. It's death. And so today we come to Genesis 4, verses 1 through 16. And we're going to see here in this especially sad story, we're going to see these, these consequences that come as the result of Adam's sin in the life of his own family. So I'm going to read for you Genesis 1, uh, or Genesis 4, 1 through 16. You can follow along. We'll have it on the screen, or you can follow along however you've got your Bible there. And now it says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the first fruit born of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and Abel, uh, rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. A lot to go there, right? It's an interesting passage. 
Um, and we're going to dig in on that here today. This chapter reveals to us that the consequences of sin and the reality of death. Over and over and over again in, in, in chapters 3 and 4 and 5 of Genesis, we have confirmed for us the reality of, of the curse which God has pronounced on Adam, even before the first bite of the fruit was taken, when, when he said to him, in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. And God had given him warning, right? And now death is everywhere, and we're going to continue to see that expanding out into the created order. But the curses of God upon Adam's disobedience now come to rest on his own family. And I want you to see, though, even in this incredibly sad story of sin and of misery, even in the midst of all of this mess, we have a picture of God and his patience. The patience of God in this story is, is, is something that maybe hasn't been featured. You might not have seen this before, but I want to make sure you see it here today. Um, God is patient here, even in this story, with an unrepentant sinner. And, and we, we even see the, the inklings of, of the mercy of God in this. And, and he's going to treat this unrepentant sinner, Cain, in a way that Cain certainly is not deserving of. And of course, it's not the last time we're going to see this either in the book of Genesis or in the Bible at all, of course. Um, we'll see this once again. God treats Esau in, in a similar way when, when he comes to the story. We'll see that uh, as we get a little further in the book of Genesis. Uh, we'll see God and his mercy allowing for blessing to continue to rest upon Esau despite his rebellion. Um, and, and God continues to do that of course, even into this day for you and for me. Now, this passage has, give or take, five different scenes in it. We're going to take it kind of one scene at a time. I didn't give you specific notes today because I thought they weren't very conducive to kind of my more traditional sermon notes, but there's a place in your notes if you'd like to take notes and follow along. And, and I'm going to kind of draw out each one of those different acts in, in this today. And the first portion of it comes from verses 1 and 2. And, and in that portion, we see the gift of life right in the shadow of the curses of God because of the sin and because of the rebellion of Adam and Eve. We see this blessing in the midst of the curse, right? Um, the blessing, of course, is that children are born to this couple. On the heels of their big screw-up, God continues to bless them anyhow, right? And God continues to display his goodness to Adam and Eve, despite the fact that they ate of the fruit they weren't supposed to eat. And we also see here an appropriate uh, believing acknowledgement of, of God's goodness and providence by Eve. As if you were reading along with me as I read that there, we, we see Eve responding in, 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 in a form of worship and praise towards God, Right? Eve is immediately aware as we read through this passage that she wouldn't have had these children if it wasn't for the blessing of God upon her life. And so God, God is blessing her and she is aware of that. That God's gift, that God's favor is still upon her and, and then thereby her, her children. Notice her words. She says, I have gotten a man or in the, you know, some of the translations a child, but the, the Hebrew actually does say man. But she's gotten a child, Cain. I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And, and now we don't know at this point what Eve was thinking. You know, she may have thought that, that Cain was perhaps the answer to some of her problems. You know, back in Genesis 3.15, if you remember that passage, part of the curse, right, that maybe she's thinking that, that Cain is going to be this one who's going to stomp out the serpent, Right? But if that's what she was thinking, there's never been a, a greater misunderstanding of, of what was going on in the story. But God continues to work and continues to bless and continues to love despite their sin. And, and Cain, of course, as we know as we read through the story, isn't the one to crush the serpent's head. Isn't the one to, to step upon him, so to speak, with his heel and crush him. 
by her seed. And so she feels that she is blessed as God gives her these children, and she praises God for it. And as we read through this passage, the, the names, of course, in the Bible always are interesting, particularly Old Testament names, and, and this is no exception here. If you've, if you've not studied this and you don't have you know, the commentaries and things, you probably wouldn't pick these kind of things up. But the names came, Cain and Abel ha- have some interesting things to them. The name Cain, the name Cain, uh, is similar to a Hebrew word, which is called Cana, which is a Q-A-N-A, and, and that word means to get, like you get something, right? And, and, and there's kind of a, a play on words going on here in the original Hebrew language as this was written by Moses. There's this kind of play of, of words going on where she says, I have gotten this man-child, right, to get. And what does she name him? She names him to get, right? Uh, that, that's his name. And then Abel comes along, another, another son, and, and, and the name Abel in Hebrew basically means vanity or mere breath. Now, mere breath and Abel kind of seem to go together, right? Because his life is like a mere breath. It's, it's shortened prematurely, right? Now, she, of course, didn't know that was going to be the case, naming him as a child. But the Bible has a lot of interesting underlying themes and things that are going on in the background. And, and I just point those out because they, they are kind of interesting tidbits as we go through this story. And, and despite being this righteous man, as we'll see here in a minute, Abel's life is, is snuffed out early and shortened. We see about their occupations, right? Cain and Abel uh, have jobs. They have work to do, just as God created work early in the Bible, and it was a good thing. These, these guys have some work to do. Cain is a, a tiller of the ground, uh, just like his father. The, he's the firstborn son. He's the oldest. So it makes sense that he would follow in his father's footsteps and and so he's a, a tiller of the ground. And then Abel, it tells us, is, is a shepherd, right? He, he raises animals. And, and, and sometimes we see, you know, I grew up in South Dakota, right? And yeah, I don't know, you, most of you don't know, although you probably know the geography of South Dakota. South Dakota is a very divided state by a river, of course. And if you live West River, you have one mentality. And if you live East River, you have another mentality. Now, of course, there's other subsects. If you live in Sioux Falls, you have one mentality, and everybody else has another mentality, but that's a separate thing. But uh, it's kind of like Minnesota. If you live in the Twin Cities and then everybody else, of course, right? And and, in South Dakota, though, you have West River and East River. I used to live in Pierce, South Dakota, which is right on the river. And, And literally, you cross that bridge into Stanley County, and it's like moving to a different state. And, and I'm not over-exaggerating. They're in a different time zone, even though it's, I don't know, 300 yards across the river, 400 yards maybe. It's a, I don't know if it's a quarter mile even. It's not very far. But, but it, it's a completely different environment when you cross over that river. And, 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 and the big reason for a lot of that is West River in South Dakota is primarily ranching. Okay? The, the, the land is not as arable uh, the soil is not as good. It's rockier. It doesn't till well. It doesn't produce as well. Eastern South Dakota, great soil, farm everywhere, right? Corn, bean, crops, wheat, you know, there's wheat, everything. Everything grows great on the eastern South Dakota. On the western side, it's cattle, it's sheep, it's prairie, it's wide open. And, and, and over the years, historically, ranchers and farmers haven't always gotten along the best because you got conflict with grazing rights and all kinds of other stuff. And so I kind of grew up with that understanding, but, but that's not the point that the Bible is trying to make. The Bible's not trying to say, well, you got one rancher and you got one farmer and they don't get along, so that's why they had conflict. The Bible's not saying that. The Bible's not just simply pointing out only that these were the occupations of these two men. The occupations weren't the source of the conflict between Cain and Abel. Um, it's not their jobs that, that bring them into division. What brings Cain and Abel into division, what causes the conflict between Cain and Abel, is the truth of the Lord. That's what brings them into conflict. Now, we're given here some good examples of, of how believers should give thanks to God for the blessing, right, that God has given us. 
We see that in Eve's response to what's going on. And we see in the story that, that God is continuing to work in Eve's heart as she acknowledges that God has clearly given me these boys or these children, and she goes, goes on, of course, to have other children, not just the two boys. And so we continue to see the goodness of God. We continue to see the blessing of God. And I don't want you to miss out on that because so often when we read through this, this passage in Genesis, when we read about the fall and we read about the brokenness and we read about the sin, we miss out on the fact that despite screwing up big, and, and you and I, if, you know, you and I, if you want to be angry about something, we should be able to yell at Adam and Eve, right? You screwed it up for us, right? Now, of course, the truth of the matter is we would have screwed it up anyhow if given the chance to because we're all sinners in need of a savior. But nonetheless, Adam and Eve, you really screwed it up for us, right? And we should be and could be and probably are a little bit angry at them for that. But despite their big mess-ups, God keeps blessing them, Right? Anybody else relate? Yeah. And we forget about that sometimes. And, and I think that's one of the big stories of this passage of Scripture that I don't want you to miss out on. That, that God keeps blessing them despite the fact these people are screw-ups. These people did some dumb things. These people were disobedient. These people were sinners. God loved them anyhow. So we see this goodness of God again and again. And she sees it again, of course, in the birth of her second child, in the birth of Abel. And, and she knows that, that God's blessing is upon her. But then we get to the kind of the second act of the story in, in verses 3 and 4 and 5. Uh, there we have kind of recorded for us this, this worship experience of Cain and Abel, right? And we see God's acceptance of Abel's offering. And we see God's rejection of Cain's offering. Now I want you to see here the distinction that God makes in our worship because this, this is important still for you and me today. You see, God still wants our hearts. And he's ready to judge whether we come to him, ready to give him our hearts, whether our worship will be acceptable to him or not. Because it's sometimes our, our worship, frankly, isn't worshiping God. It's worshiping self. It's worshiping my preference or my needs or my wants. And it's me, 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 me. And it's easy for all of us to, to fall prey to that. And to not actually be worshiping God, but to be worshiping self. And so we have to keep that in mind as, as we come in worship. So in this passage... We see the family gathering for worship. Cain and Abel, of course, both bring offerings. And, and, and this reminds us as we go through it that even this is before the establishment of the priesthood, right? There, there was no hierarchy of worship. There was no official priest. There was no pastors. There was nobody professionally involved in ministry. It was family worship. And who was leading this? Well, Adam would have been leading this. Adam would have been the head of the household, so he would have been in charge. He would have been leading his family and saying, hey, God has been good to us. Let us come together. Let us bring an offering to the Lord. Come on in. And that's what they're doing here. And, and so Adam would have been the leader. And we see this continue on in the Old Testament of all the people. You know, you see it in Abraham leading his family. And uh, Abraham acts in, 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 in a way as the priest for his family. Um, and we see that throughout this Old Testament before even the establishment uh, of, so to speak, a, a clergy class of people. And so family worship is incredibly important. And that falls, for those of you who are listening, if we are men leading a household, we are the primary bearers of that responsibility as we see modeled here in Scripture. And so that's not really the point of the sermon today, but men, it is on us to be responsible to shepherd our families, just as Adam, just as Abraham, and just as others throughout the Bible uh, did throughout time. And so the family has gathered, they're worshiping. 
Cain and Abel come and we see this recording of, of their offerings, right? And, and sometimes people focus on the fact that, that Cain brought some grains, something from the ground, right? An offering from the soil. Then Abel brings an animal, right? An animal sacrifice has blood. And, and you can become distracted by that, be, but that isn't the point of what's going on here. Uh, the reason God likes one offering and the, uh, dislikes the other offering isn't because one came from the ground and one came from an animal. That is not the point of what's going on here. The text doesn't even hint at that. And interestingly, the text doesn't even tell us explicitly why God does reject Cain, why God does reject his offering, why God accepts Abel's but not Cain's. In fact, we're only given two hints if you were paying attention to why this happens. And so if, you, if you're making notes, these are probably things to make note of if you're interested in these sorts of things. Um, the first thing we need to recognize, though, is that since this passage did not tell us the exact meaning of God's rejection of the sacrifice, we've got to be careful we don't speculate too far as to why it is that it was rejected. But we also don't want to begin thinking, for whatever reason, that God, God just arbitrarily rejects this offering. Because the last thing I want you to hear is that. God is not arbitrary. There's nothing arbitrary at all about the actions of God. God has a plan. He has a reason for all the things that he does. There's always reasons. But the Lord, for whatever reason, doesn't choose to share with us, which can be frustrating, why he rejected Cain's offering. He doesn't tell us what his reasons were. But having said that, I think the text does give us some hints. Um, look at verse 3. It says, he brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And that's all that it said. Then of Abel's offering, it says two details, right? It says uh, that it, Abel brings of the firstborn, and then he brings of, of their fat portion right? There seems at least to be a hint that there is a costliness to Abel's sacrifice, that, that his giving is costing something. It's not just, eh, I had some stuff, so I threw it up there, right? No, that it was the first fruits. It was the, 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 the so to speak, the best of the flock, He's giving the best of the best of the best. Well, there's no indication that Cain maybe picked out his best grains or, or whatever else, right? And secondly, in, in Cain's response to the Lord in verse 5, we see another kind of interesting thing going on. That, that you kind of get a hint of arrogance in Cain, right? Did you catch that when you were reading it? Now, you might say, well, yeah, of course, Cain's going to be a little angry and arrogant after God's rejected his sacrifice. But imagine this for a minute, right? You come to God. You bring God an offering. And God looks at it and says, huh, that's not worthy. Is it our place to be angry at God for being judge over what is and isn't worthy, right? No, of course not. We, we see Cain here responding in that way, however. He brings it to God, and God says, this isn't your best work. You're not bringing me your best. You're kind of phoning it in. You're kind of mailing it in. And Cain has the gall to be angry about that. You, you what? Right? What do you mean? You're not going to accept my offering. And he kind of has an arrogance to him. Abel gives the good stuff humbly. Cain has this arrogance and begins to question whether or not God can be the judge over what is and isn't acceptable. And therein lies the rub, really, with Cain. The New Testament kind of gets at this as well. As we... As we read about this story, there's not a whole lot given here in the Old Testament, but there's a couple, couple of references in the New Testament 
The, the first one comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. I'll read that for you. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. And so it's intimated there that, that Abel came to the Lord in faith as he was bringing this offering. That as Abel was there in worship, he was doing it faithfully. Whereas Cain was not. Another reference would come from 1 John 3.11. And there we read, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So, so John drives home this point that the command of Christ is to love one another. And Cain kind of violates this fundamental principle because love one another includes love of God and love of others, right? And then it goes on in verse 12 of that passage and says, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. For what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Well, again, what were the deeds that Cain did? He kind of half-heartedly brought this worship offering. That was the distinction between the two of them. And so the New Testament helps bring a little bit of clarity to this Old Testament story. And we see that Abel was a righteous man, and that Cain's heart, even before he gets angry with the Lord, wasn't right with the Lord. But I also want you to see in this passage here in Genesis 4, what brings division between Abel and Cain? The division is brought about by the presence of God. The division between these two brothers is brought about by Cain's exposure to the truth of God. By, by God exposing Cain as half-heartedly worshiping, Cain becomes angry at God and angry at his brother, right? It creates division between the two of them. Now listen to me closely here. In Genesis 3.15, God promised to establish enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Remember that, right? Now here are two brothers who, who as far as we know, didn't have any conflict prior to this. Now you might, you know, I grew up with a brother, right? And some of you have raised a couple of boys. Boys have conflict, right? But this is remembered just on the heels of the Garden of Eden, before sin had completely defiled and corrupted the world. Yes, sin had entered in, but the world wasn't nearly as broken as it is now, I don't think. And we have no recorded conflict between the two of these prior to this point. God warns that this enmity is coming. That there's going to be conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent suddenly, in recognition of God's rejection of his sacrifices, hates the seed of the woman and strikes out against him to bruise his heel. So once again, we see God's establishment of enmity between his people and the people of the world, the people who are not following him. Sometimes you will be unliked by the people of this world simply because they find your faith to be convicting. Have you ever experienced this? I know I have, right? There are people who simply don't like me because I'm a pastor. Not because I've ever done them wrong. Not because I've ever said bad things about them. Not because of anything I've done or not done. They don't like me because I'm a pastor. Because it reminds them of their sin. Right? Maybe, maybe you were one of those people. You ever been called a goody two-shoes? Right? That's an old term. Right? But some of you have been called a goody two-shoes, I bet. Right? Don't drink, don't smoke, what do you do? Remember that song? I mean, in our circles, in Baptist circles, no carts, no dancing, right? There's a bunch of things you don't do. 
And if you were one of those people who didn't do those, and you were hanging out with the people who did do those things, sometimes they feel convicted that what they're doing is wrong. Uh, I'm not saying dancing is wrong and playing cards is wrong. Uh, that's not the point. But sometimes just the way that we live as Christians, if we are following Christ, if we are exhibiting the love of God into the world through our lives, that's going to cause conflict sometimes because it makes some people uncomfortable. When you're around somebody with a, a, a deeper or richer faith, it can be very convicting. And so people resist that. And I think that's some of what was going on here between Cain and Abel. Notice again in verses 6 and 7 that even after Cain's unworthy sacrifice, though, God in his patience, God in his mercy, he comes to Cain, right? We see God appealing to Cain here. Cain, who's angry at God, God comes to him. As backward as that sounds. The God, the creator of the whole universe that we've been studying, the one who, on a pile of dirt, makes man, the God who made all the stars out of nothing, would humble himself to come down to Cain, who's angry at him, right? Do you see the audacity of that? Because the Bible wants you to see the, the craziness of that, in fact, right? How absurd is it that the Creator God would lower Himself to come down and meet with this sinner? Oh, yeah. He's done that for you and me, too, hasn't He? That's how God works even today. So God comes down to Cain who's angry at him because he feels like God has been unjust towards him. And God effectively almost pleads with him, right? He appeals to his reason. He's concerned about Cain. He's worried. Cain, pay attention here. You, you, you're treading a fine line and you're looking like you might be going the wrong direction. He tries to give warning to Cain. He warns Cain, if, if that sin that you're entertaining masters you, there's going to be some wreckage. There's going to be some damage. Danger will result if you continue on this path you're taking. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture. These words that come in verse 7 are, are powerful. God says to him, if you do well... Will you not be accepted, Cain? But hear me, Cain, I'm warning you. If you do not do well, if you don't make the right choices, if you don't act, if you don't do the right things here, sin is crouching at the door. Right? Reminds me, uh, I used to work in New Mexico. I was a backpacking guide for a number of summers when I used to work for the Boy Scouts of America. And one summer I spent in, in a canyon specifically. We were building some backpacking trails. I was a trail building foreman for one summer. During that summer, we happened to have a mama mountain lion and her cubs living in that very same canyon with us, right? Now, we never saw the mountain lion, not in person. And I had a total of 30 people on site throughout the summer. We didn't see her once. We heard her. We heard her cubs. We saw her footprints everywhere. Occasionally, we would see some results of one of her kills, but we never saw that mountain lion, right? And occasionally, you know, uh, I'm out in the woods. This is the Rocky Mountains in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico. There's not flush toilets or anything fancy. You go out in the woods and do your business, right? And... Occasionally at dusk or dawn, early in the morning, late at night, if you're out there all by yourself, you're kind of looking up in those trees wondering where Mama Mountain Lion might possibly be, right? And when God warns Cain that sin is basically crouched behind the door waiting to pounce, 
I kind of remember those days and that, that always present little bit of fear that Mama Mountain Lion might be somewhere lurking. Now, mountain lion attacks in humans are incredibly rare, so my fear is somewhat illogical, but most fears are illogical, right? But I had a little worry about that mountain lion. And God is warning Cain, Cain, it's crouching there. This, the sin is waiting to jump out and get you, right? You're going down a path you shouldn't go down, Cain. And so God takes this opportunity to try to redirect Cain, to try to steer him from the path that he's on. And, and that warning of sin lurking, waiting to jump on us, right? It's such a great warning. It's a, a, an idea that comes through the rest of Scripture so frequently. That, that sin is, once it gets in us, it kind of intertwines itself within us, right? And, 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 and as sin gets into us, it, it can continue to multiply upon itself and, and worsen and worsen and worsen and multiply upon itself to greater and greater things and become more and more serious, right? James says this in James 1.13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by his own desire. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Wow. Powerful words from James. Can you hear the, the echo of God's words to Cain in that passage from James? Sin is crouching at our doors. Sin is ready to pounce upon us like, like a wild animal that's ready to pounce upon its prey. And if we don't master it, Cain, if you don't master this, if we don't master this sin, it's going to lead us into a direction of greater and greater danger and destruction than we already currently are. Or think of Paul's words in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 8. Paul says these words. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. And so sin taking the opportunity in Paul, took advantage to produce coveting within him of every kind and sort, right? And trapping Paul. And he understood of the expanding consequences of his sin. But even as we see Cain's sin begin to escalate, right? It starts off with he kind of half-heartedly worships. Then he gets angry at God what happens next? He's going to kill his brother. Murder, right? That's a, if you're charting sin, that's kind of a big jump, right? But it's this upward trajectory, and, and sin has that effect. But even though we see the sin escalating, we see God's patience and mercy on display despite that. And then again in verses 8 through 12, this is kind of the fourth scene of this passage. And we've got this one and one more and we'll finish up. We see Abel's murder, right? And we see God's sentence against Cain. In verses 8 through 12, we see the consequences of sin that's been kind of harbored and nursed. Uh, that, that Cain has been carrying the sin now for a little while. He's been dabbling in this sin. He's been holding on to the sin and and he's been letting it fester in his life. I don't know about you, but have you ever nursed a grudge, right? You ever been angry about something at somebody and just let it nibble at you, let it eat at you, let it just continue on, on and on and on? You, you've got this thing and you're just angry about something and, and it just keeps festering and just keeps growing and, oh, right? Building resentment. We've been offended. And so we work it over and over and over again in our minds, right? 
And we become more and more bitter through that. We begin to contemplate, how am I going to get my revenge? How am I going to be vindicated? And, and, and what am I, what am I going to do to, to have, you know, an eye for an eye? Because that's our, our, our sinful desire. So the Lord comes to Cain. And he effectively says, Cain, let it go, right? Master that sin. Master that bitterness. Put it behind you. Get control of this resentment. Or, buddy, it's going to dominate you. And what does Cain do? He doesn't listen, right? He lets the bitterness continue to grow. And, of course, as bitterness does, when you harbor it, it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. I think most of us have experienced that, right? And finally, in verse 8, we see him kill his brother because of it. Isn't it interesting? The very first death in the Bible isn't the death from old age, isn't the death from disease. The first death in the fallen world is a murder. And we see here the fruition of God's curse against Adam for his sin. And on the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die, God said. And not only does death come in, but in this case, it's the firstborn son, which we know, we've studied the Bible before. That firstborn son was so incredibly important in this culture. Can you imagine Adam and Eve standing in a field over the body of Abel, knowing directly and indirectly this was their fault. This was the consequence of their sin in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3, we saw the animal, the serpent, exercise dominion over the covenant keepers, over Adam and Eve, right? Now we see sin exercising dominion over Cain. Sin dominates Cain. And then again in verse 9, God comes looking for Cain, right? Did you catch that? God comes down looking for Cain. When had God come down and started looking for somebody before? Just a few verses before, right? Adam. Adam eats the apple. God comes down into the garden. Adam, where are you at? Not because he doesn't know where Adam's at, but he wants to get Adam's attention. God comes seeking Adam. God comes seeking Cain. But notice Cain's disregard for both his brother and for the Lord. Cain, where's your brother? Again, you think God doesn't know where Abel's at? No, God knows Abel's laying dead on the ground. There's not a question about God's knowledge. He's trying to get to Cain's heart. Cain, where is Abel? What is Cain's response? Well, I don't know. Right? Yeah, you know, buddy, you just killed him. He's over there. Oh, am I my brother's keeper? He tries to play dumb, right? You ever had your kids do this to you? Well, I don't know. If I didn't do it and mom didn't do it, I'm pretty sure the dog didn't do it. Probably you, son. Right? Am I my brother's keeper? But notice in that, while I make a joke about it, 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 there's no love there for man. There's no love there for God. It's an insolent response, right? It's an inappropriate and effectively rude response to God. That's what we see here in verse 9. Cain exhibiting no love for man and no love for God. Then in verse 10, we begin to see the beginnings of, of this curse that God is going to put upon him. And in verse 11, we see the full force of that curse. Now you are cursed from the ground, Cain. This curse here is directly a curse against Cain. You, you might remember I'd mentioned this before. Despite their sin, Adam and Eve were not directly cursed, right? God never said, Eve, because you ate of this apple, 
Adam, because you ate of this apple, you guys, because you disobeyed, you are cursed. That's not what God said. The word to Adam was, the ground is cursed because of you. But now the curse becomes worse, stronger. Cain, you are cursed apart from the ground. So we see a, a direct cursing of Cain here. And he's sentenced to toil and he's sentenced to wandering. Cain, who had been a tiller of the soil. Many of you know, grew up in farm families, were farmers yourselves oftentimes, right? I have lots of relatives who are farmers. Farmers tend not to go very far from their farm, particularly back in the olden days, right? I have a long history of family farmers. And if you look at where they married people, almost every one of my relatives married somebody who, if you drew a circle on a map, was within 15 minutes of where they were born and where they died. Going back for many generations, the only interruption, of course, is when my family came from Germany to the United States. That kind of interrupts that process a little bit. But once they got here, once they settled in eastern South Dakota, again, put a pin on a map and draw a circle, and they all married people within this circle, right? Farmers don't, don't, don't range very far because they got work to do. They got animals to care for. They got crops to raise. They, they, they stay where they're planted, so to speak. Now Cain is cursed. You're going to wander. Here's a man who, who loved the earth, who tilled the soil. That was who he was. This curse gets fundamentally to the root of who he is. Adam had been told that because of his sin, it was not going to be harder to reap benefits from the ground. Cain basically is being rejected by the ground, right? It escalates. You're going to be a nomad, Cain, for the rest of your life. And did you catch where he's sent to? He's sent to the land of Nod, right? That's not the place where you go when your pastor gets boring. No, he goes to the land of Nod. What does Nod mean? Another interesting little name in the Bible. The word Nod means wandering. You are sent to the land of wandering. That is his curse. And now the ground will not yield for him. And once again, we see that sin only brings misery. Misery for the victim's family, misery for the perpetrator, right? Did sinning help relieve Cain's problems? No. It increased his problems. And so we see the consequences of sin. And that's a good rule for life, by the way, right? If you are having problems, stop sinning and adding to it, right? That sounds like an oversimplification, but that really is often the key to our problems. If you're having problems, stop sinning. That will solve most of your problems. Quit doing the dumb thing that's causing this to be a problem, right? The sinning isn't help in any sort of way to solve the problem. And then finally, in verses 13 through 16, we see the hardness of an unrepentant heart. And we see the patience and the restraint of God. In verse 13, after Cain has done these things, Cain has the, the nerve to protest about God's sentence against him, right? That's not fair. You can't do that. Uh, this is, so to speak, the first temper tantrum in the Bible, I think. This hard-hearted man speaks against God. His heart and heart says, Lord, your sentence is unfair. Had Cain been repentant, he would have said, Lord, your mercy is undeserved. Your sentence is fair. But that's always the case for us, isn't it? When we get caught in our sin, a lot of times our first response is, that's not a fair punishment. When God, God of course always knows our sins, but when we feel like we're caught by God in our sins and then there is some sort of repercussion because of our behavior, behavior has consequences and all of a sudden something happens and we're like, 
oh, these consequences don't seem fair, right? Woe is me. But if we were truly repentant, a repentant heart understands fully that if we were to receive what we truly deserved, we would absolutely be under the condemnation of God. But that's not what God does for us, does he? God is gracious and merciful and long-suffering on our behalf. When we sin, if we would confess our sins to him, if we would go to him and say, God, I have made a mistake, he is good and he will forgive us. But so frequently we want to reject, we want to push back against that judgment. We want to say that's unfair. But kind of like I said back at the beginning, how crazy it is that us, that us as the creations would go to the creator and go, yeah, your judgment's not fair. I know better than you. That would be absurd, but yet that's what we try to do. And that's what Cain effectively does in this story. But even in the midst of that, God continues to show mercy to him. Hopefully you've heard today the mess that sin makes in our lives. And the grace that God continues to pour upon us nonetheless. One of the wisest adages I've ever heard is if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Right? And how true is that for us in our life with sin? Sin has a grip on your heart. Whether it's anger, resentment, bitterness, selfishness, pride, oh, there's all kinds of different sins. What is the first step to getting out of it? Stop digging. Stop worsening the problem. Stop multiplying the problem. Covering sin with other sins isn't going to make the sin go away. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That is the story we are hearing today. If you find yourself in that situation, repent, stop digging, and move forward as one who God comes down to just as he came down to Adam, just as he came down to Eve, just as he came down to Cain. The God who created the universe continues to come to us, the sinner, because he wants to be in relationship with you and with me. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word and the reminder that God, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. We are all broken. We all live in a broken world, and the effects of sin are great. And the problem is sometimes, Lord, instead of repenting, we double down. Instead of walking away from our sin and say, yeah, that was a bad choice. Yeah, I've been making some bad choices. Yeah, I've been moving in the wrong direction. Instead, God... We ignore your warning that sin is just crouching behind the door waiting. It's lurking. It's ready to pounce on us. And we continue down the wrong path. So God, maybe today this was a, something we needed to hear, an eye-opener for our hearts that, that reminds us that you are a God who continues to forgive, that you are a God who is so willing to show compassion upon us, to give us your grace, to give us your mercy. If simply we would turn to you. And God, that's true for believers and non-believers both. We all need to turn to you each and every day. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. And God, maybe somebody listening today has never heard that before, that they are the problem, that sin has broken them, and that they are not the solution to the problem. In fact, God, we just 
make a mess of things and make things worse. But you didn't leave us in that mess, God. You didn't forget us. You didn't abandon us. You didn't say, oh, you're a bunch of screw-ups and I don't want nothing to do with you. No, God, you said, I love you. And I desire to be in relationship with you and I want to pour my blessing out upon you. And so in that, God, you sent your son Jesus into the world to live a life we could not live, to die a death we could not die, to raise from the grave conquering sin and conquering death, that he might sit at the, your right hand of judgment so that those who know and follow him will one day be seen as spotless, pure, and perfect rather than as sinners. God, we are so thankful for that. We thank you for your rich, your deep, your abiding, your never stopping, your never ending love. God, as we go forth from this place today, may we take that love wherever you would send us. May we share that love. May we be patient with others. May we get our hearts right with you, and then may we help others do so as well. God, continue to pour your blessing upon us, watching over us and keeping us. It is in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, we're so thankful that you have joined us for worship today. And if we can pray for you, bless you, love you, serve you in some sort of way, shape, or form from here at Glory Baptist Church, please let us know. We would delight in doing so. And as you go, of course, remember, wash your hands frequently, make much of Jesus always, stay awesome, and go and serve your King. It's good to see you all. Thanks for coming. God bless.